Hello, I'm Dr. Jay McCartney. I'm a consultant chartered psychologist in the UK. I'm fascinated by all human behaviour, but particularly crime and criminals. What kind of things go through their head? What makes them tick? Remember, in these videos, I'm not diagnosing anybody. I'm just speculating as to what I think may have happened. In today's video, I'm going to look at the case of the missing estate agent Susie Lamplew and particularly the person that the police have said under no uncertain terms that is a person of interest to them, John Cannon. Before I start, if I could ask you to please like, subscribe and please feel free to, to put any comments below, that would be really great. So John Cannon was born in 1954 can't find huge amounts about his background. I think he has two siblings, a brother and a sister. So nothing particularly remarkable. That's often what happens when you're, you're trying to research somebody's family and you can't find anything. There's nothing particularly remarkable about it. Apart from in 1968, he would crop up for the first time on the police radar as he had indecently insulted somebody. I think it was to do with in, in a telephone box even or something. He was put on probation then, as most 14-year-olds probably would have been at the time. And there was also another incident where he had assaulted a girlfriend that he had tried to leave. If we go on, there's a, a, a huge amount of crimes that he was attributed to. He was, in 1981, there was a knife point robbery at a knitwear shop. And not only did he, he do the robbery, but he also sexually assaulted the two members of staff that were there and one of them had their baby with them and he threatened the baby as well. He was given a sentence of eight years for that um, and he, he was from the west of, of the UK, the southwest of the UK, the Bristol area and he seemed to have this MO of, he was a very they describe him as a lady killer, a charmer. He could really turn on the charm with women when he wanted to. And there's some footage of him at, um, you know, before the days of internet dating, of, of him at a, um, a, a video dating site. And you can see where he was coming from in his head. Not everybody would be taken in by this. He was just probably too much of a, a smooth or smarmy customer but you could see where he was coming from with this and colleagues would say that when you know he worked um various in various jobs and colleagues would say that you could walk into a shop with him and within five minutes he'd got a date with the girl behind the counter he was that well versed in his his operation of what he wanted which was to get women to have sex with them to get in a relationship with them there were various reports of his relationships when once the charm had, you know, the gloss had soon gone off that relationship and when people weren't doing what he wanted them to do, then the, in inverted commas, the real John Cannon would come out and he would be domineering and abusive and narcissistical and controlling all the things that a, a narcissist would be if he wasn't getting his own way. Once he had served his first sentence, he, you know, he was implicated in quite a few different crimes, but they, it was before the days of DNA and they could never quite get enough evidence to put him at the scene of, of, of an assault or in some cases of a, a dead body. And quite often the women, they were all of a kind of certain age, you know, young kind of newly married or you know sort of like 20s or so they would disappear and then he they would be found uh by rivers and of course that's a classic example of somebody that is forensically aware because they know that the water and the exposure to elements is going to to get rid of any potential what would have probably been then uh, forensic stains or fingerprints nothing dna enabling in 1987, he would abduct a, a woman in a car park in in Bristol, but at, at knife point, but she was able to fight him off. The following day, a young newlywed called Shirley Banks was on her way home from, from work, and she'd gone up to her, her little mini, her little red mini that she had, and she was on her way home. And that was the last that really anybody ever heard of her, because it, he abducted her, Cannon abducted her 
And all the evidence eventually led to him. Her body was found, and but all the evidence would lead to him. So the police would go round, they would find the um, evidence of her being having been at her, her, his flat, and they reckoned that she was probably there for about four days. There was an incident where she actually managed to call a taxi, a local taxi firm, to come and get her or come and rescue her. But when the taxi driver turned up, Cannon was able to intercept him and say that it was just a mistake. So what was going through that poor woman's head at that time that she thought she may have been able to escape from him, which she ultimately wasn't able to do? They found her car in his property in his garage he, he had crudely repainted it he tried to claim that he had been sold to him by somebody at the local pub or something trying to deny anything to do with him and the evidence mounted up and he was convicted of a murder and that is what he was he is currently serving his sentence for um there was talk about the time when Shirley gone missing that somebody whether it was her or whether it was him pretending to be hit her had called into her her work that not, uh, the following morning to say that she wasn't coming in sick so not to raise suspicion so you have somebody here that is very aware of what they're doing very aware that people will be looking for her will be concerned about her absence and he's trying to do something to to kind of mollify that awareness that may have of course ended up with the the police which it it did now, if we turn to the Susie Lamplew case, now she was an estate agent, she's a very famous case in the UK. She was an estate agent in the mid 1980s, 1986. It was the time where, you know, lots of people were, it, it was kind of like a really buzzy time in London and lots of people would come, you know, as they still do, but lots of people would come from out of town to come and work in London. She was very successful at what she did. She seemed to catch the public interest because not only did she just literally disappear from sight and she's just never been found, nothing has ever been found about her from that fateful day that she went to meet a, a so-called viewing at one of her properties, a Mr. Kipper, but also she had a likeness to the late Princess of Wales, to Diana, Princess of Wales. So I think that's one of the reasons she was very photogenic. So that was one of the reasons why she just seemed to get the imagination and the interest of the press. And it was the summer and it would just seem to generate an awful lot of interest. And also her family were very vocal in keeping her, um, her, 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 her memory and her disappearance alive so that's why she was always in the in the in the news and it's interesting that it's coming up to a, an anniversary of her, her death a sad death a 35 year anniversary and there is a case of a man who sadly died himself and this is up in I think it was Northampton or Bedfordshire no it's in Bedfordshire that he said a couple of days after Susie had gone missing, he was going to work early in the morning, about five o'clock in the morning, along a towpath. And he didn't expect to see anybody because it's five o'clock in the morning. And he saw this man that matched Cannon's description coming towards him, seemingly either with sort of like a wheelbarrow or a, uh, a, a kind of wheeled device with something heavy on it. And he thought this was hugely unusual. And he said, five o'clock in the morning, you would expect to just kind of pass a nicety with somebody on a summer's morning. You would expect to pass a nicety because it's so unusual to see each other. And he said that he just went past him and he avoided his gaze and kind of turned his head. So he potentially he was thinking that you won't recognize me in, in uh, you know months to come. And once they'd actually passed each other on this towpath, he said he heard the sound of something being splashed into the water. Now, this is Bedford, which is quite a far way out of London. And the man who saw this reported it to his local police, but seemingly this was never passed on. Now, he has sadly died, but he has said this story to a friend of his who is repeating it. So whether they're going to look in this particular area or not, I, I don't know, but certainly... Susie Lampley's brother is is asking police to do so. So now I'm going to come on to John Cannon's personality. And I'm going to use the five factor model here. So it's openness to new experiences, conscientiousness, extrovertism, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Openness to new experiences, he scores very highly on. He was kind of fairly unconventional, but he was kind of open to 
finding out new things and hence going on, on dating websites. Not many people would have gone on dating websites in the, in the 80s if they weren't, you know, very open to having new experiences, to kind of enjoying things. Conscientiousness, he kind of scores that low medium because he was fairly persistent in what he wanted and he was very motivated in what he wanted. But of course, from the point of view of any particular planning, I don't think he was particularly planning I think it was just ad hoc the the attacks that he would make and he just had a low conscience as in what he was doing did he bother about how is this was affecting people so of course not so he kind of scores a medium on that extrovertism very high again as I said you know when he's on his dating websites agreeableness could be very agreeable again remember it's a scale you can have highly agreeable on one side and you can have very disagreeable on the other side so could be highly agreeable when it suited him but could be completely disagreeable you know when they're asking him about the Susie Lamplew case and also another case that he has been implicated in the case of Sandra Court they're asking him about those and he's just completely disagreeable and, and not saying anything that he's, he's potentially going to implicate him and neurotic it, it can People like him, they score fairly high in some cases because they're always ready and they're paranoid that their current partner or the person that they're with is going to reject them. Um, but then at the same time, it, it could be fairly evened out because he was so successful in getting dates and, and getting and women. Now, if I just look at um, the analysis of Canon and what I think he thought about women were... They were just there for the taking, whether it was chatting some girl up in a petrol station or a shop or whether it was literally grabbing somebody off the street. They were just there for the taking. There's no evidence that I can find of him being a user of sex workers, which often people with like Canon and his background often are. And there's no um, evidence of that. And I think the reason for that was because he probably would have thought of sex workers of, uh, as a lower form of human being. And they weren't for him. He had to get the girls that weren't the sex workers. <clears throat> and whether he could get them legitimately by chatting them up or whether he just literally had to snatch them off the streets or hold them to gunpoint, they, to him, to his ego, they were the type of women that he should have been getting, not the ones that were available for money. So I think that's the reason why we probably can't find that. And he was a thrill seeker, you know, open to a new experience. So he was a thrill seeker and a sensation seeker. And that probably would have given him the thrill that literally, I'm literally taking you off the street and nobody's ever going to find you through one reason or another and that probably would have appealed to his type of ego his type of personality and the message that he would have sent to himself because though he's a person of interest whereas nobody else is in the two cases of Sandra Court and Susie Lamplew to him the message that he still has to himself is he's potentially got away with this so those are my thoughts about the missing Susie Lamplew and the murder of Sandra Court but also of John Cannon himself the person as I've said the police have said they're not looking for anybody else in connection particularly to the the these particular crimes and just to give you an idea of what potentially he may have been thinking along all of these lines and what his personality was so when it comes to missing women I'm, I'm saying this potentially about canon but also about other people that have committed crimes where bodies are missing there is a sadistic element there's an element of i don't want to be implicated because then i'll end up in prison for even more but also there is also a sadistic element to it and if you look at the video that i made i'll, I'll put the link above to it to levi belfield it's very similar to that there's a sadistic nature to it because you're enjoying not only the power that you have and the control that you believe that you have but you're also enjoying the suffering of others and you know which is the absolute hallmark of the sadist so those are the thoughts I have about John Cannon and his potential crimes and the crimes that he has actually been convicted for Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this analysis interesting. And if you could please put some comments below and like and subscribe, it just helps the channel enormously. That would be absolutely great. Thanks for watching. Keep safe and I'll see you next time.